What is going on, you guys? Welcome back to Down to the Wire. I'm your host, Brian Costa, and today we will be discussing the Boston Celtics falling short of history in Game 7 after their loss to the Miami Heat. We will speculate what potential offseason moves need to be made in order to get them back on, back into the finals and how the Heat will also fare against the Nuggets as they move on from the East. Um, however, before we begin, I'd like to welcome back a special guest of the show, he is one of the largest Celtics followings on social media and is a diehard fan of the green. So without any further ado, please welcome back to the show, Mr. Ian and Angelo. Ian, I wish it was on better terms, but I am glad to have you back on the show. So uh, thank you for joining me today. No problem. Thanks for having me back on. Yeah. So, Ian, I want you to kind of break it down for me. I mean, I know that, you know, you and I, we were both following this team throughout their run in the Eastern Conference Finals and the playoffs in general. And it's unfortunate that we're even in the situation, the fact that we had to battle back to a game seven. But uh, if you kind of want to recap the series in your mind, I'll let you kind of have some opening thoughts. Yeah, so I think one word to describe this playoff run for the Celtics was exhausting. Mm. Like, it was exhausting watching this playoff run. I mean, first off, having to make Atlanta a six-game series when it pretty much could have been over in five or four same thing with the Philadelphia series. They go down 3-2 in two games that they lost. They shouldn't have lost. Um, they end up coming back. Tatum breaks the record for most points in a game seven. And we think it's it's all good. You know, Miami's the eighth seed. And they immediately go up 3-0 on us. And, I, I mean, a lot of Celtics fans, including myself, thought the series was over at that point. Uh, then they make it, they make a comeback. They win the next two games. Then down in Miami, Derek White has maybe the best, one of the best buzzer beaters in Celtics history. And then we go into game seven. Everyone's thinking there's no way, no way the Celtics are going to lose game seven at home. And they completely get destroyed. And the season is over. Yeah. I mean, you kind of put it into perfect words right there of just like, what like by this season was exhausting that's for sure and it really is just a big season of what ifs now because you know you come off the nba finals lost to the golden state warriors last year and it looked like we had a more well-rounded more talented team that could uh get us over that hump and it really felt like a lot of things were breaking our way not only with uh um, you know, having to face a lower seed in the conference finals, but the fact that that lower seed actually took out the number one team uh, in the East that this year, the Milwaukee Bucks, we didn't even have to face Giannis this year, which was incredible for us. Uh, but like you said, we shouldn't have had to take this series to sit. We shouldn't have had to take the Atlanta series to six games. And then the fact that Philly got dragged out as much as that was too, which just killed us. So I understand that in this game, in this, it became do or die. It eventually just had to become a seven game series. But that's the part that really just gets me about this. Like, I really thought that, you know, had we managed this a playoff run better and had we just been able to finish guys off, we could have been in a much better place. Yeah, and I mean, that was the problem the Celtics had last year, too, on their way to the finals. I mean, let's see, what was the Eastern Conference? Uh, not the Eastern Conference finals, the semifinals against Milwaukee. Mm. Game five against the Bucks, where they completely collapsed at home and had to go on the road for game six and try to win the series then. I mean, in the Eastern Conference Finals, there were games where the Celtics just looked like they didn't show up and they forgot to play basketball against Miami. And then, obviously, in the finals, we saw just the culmination of all of that, you know, just sadly unfolding in front of us. Yeah, and then got, it just got kinda... to see. Oh, yeah, go ahead. We got to see. I was going to say we got to see for our very own eyes just how good Steph Curry can be. But, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but then, uh, I mean, it's just kind of deja vu all over again. Pretty much the same. The same things that made us lose the finals were kind of the same reasons and kind of the same, you know, culprit as to why the Celtics lost this Eastern Conference Finals. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's pretty exhausting. I think you actually put out a TikTok about it of like, I think it was like the past five years or so of just saying like there's always next year. And that's not always going to be the case. Like you're not going to be able to say with this team that there's just going to be a next season. Luckily we're in a situation where these guys are extremely young. You have uh, Tatum, who's only 25 uh, Brown, who's only 26, but there's a lot of questions as to what's going to happen with those guys moving forward. And, 
you know, it's really unfortunate what happened in the game seven with Jason Tatum first offensive possession of the game going up just for, you know, somewhat basic kind of layup put back and just, you know, completely rolls his ankle. So like, there's nothing you can do about that other than the fact of just saying like, I don't know, like if you don't have your guys playing all these games and you can, you know, finish series earlier, there's a chance that maybe your player won't be rolling an ankle in game seven. Like if you can actually just finish these things off earlier, you limit the potential risk of injury. So there's that, that that's kind of what I think of that. But uh, it, that like once Tatum went down with that, it just felt like like the entire team lost, lost their life. I, I really felt like the, like for the first five minutes of game seven, I actually felt like there was a significant swing in favor of the Celtics. I, the Celtics somewhat felt in control of that game when they, you know, I think through the first like four minutes of the game, I felt pretty strong about the team, but once Miami flipped the momentum to their side, it didn't waver and it just stayed on was stayed with them the entire rest of the game. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, once Tatum got hurt, it kind of felt like the entire team just deflated mm-hmm. and it sucks because it happened on the first play of the game. And I mean, you would, and like, I mean, the beginning of the game, I, I could see that it may have been a problem because they started like O of eight from three yeah. and like, they couldn't, they couldn't hit a shot in the first quarter and it was kind of annoying to watch, but Miami was having some of the same problems. So you thought, Oh, maybe if the Celtics can just see a couple of these go in, you know, maybe they can go on a run here like they did in previous games and the run just never came. And you could say that's because Jason Tatum wasn't moving the way that, you know, he obviously know he can, because I have a feeling if Jason Tatum was healthy, I feel like he would have played a whole lot better. Oh yeah. Still 14 points and 11 rebounds. And I think he had like what, five assists or something. Yeah. On a, on even on one, even all that on a, on one ankle is impressive enough, but you know, it kind of feels like he, he was kind of zapped of, a lot of his explosiveness in that game. And I mean, that's not really an excuse as to why the Celtics lost, because there's plenty of reasons why the Celtics lost the series in general, but that was kind of a big reason as to why they lost game seven. And I feel like the next person we're going to talk about is also kind of a big reason as to why they lost in game seven. So, yeah, like, yeah, like you said, um, Jason Tatum, like, you know, that's a big loss for us, but it wasn't the only reason we lost this, this game and this series too. I mean, if you were to say that this game came down to, you know, everything with Jason Tatum, sure. I mean, he had obviously a huge impact in this game, but he was far from the case going forward. And um, he wasn't even the only guy that was, you know, battling through uh, pain throughout this game. I mean, Robert Williams was throwing up in between quarters um, in the locker room because he had apparently a really bad stomach illness, which uh, came to light in the past couple of days. So uh, just a really rough stretch for the Seas. Yeah, I would have I would have thrown up too if I had to watch the Celtics play in Game Seven. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, in in reality, it just kind of sucks. Yeah, because... and and the thing I'll say too, Ian, is that this series and this whole thing, it's a matter of two things. It was the fact that uh, we couldn't put teams away, and it's also the fact that we couldn't deal with any adversity where the Heat could. The Heat were able yeah. to get up on us early. They understood what they needed to do, and they established a good 3-0 lead, which proved to be a critical cushion for them. And, you know, obviously the Celtics, they battled back. They were able to, you know, outmatch them in those in those three games. And, uh, you know, going into game six, you have Derek White with one of the potential, like, all-time buzzer beaters, which you mentioned. For a lot of teams, they would have folded over and said, "Like, all right, like th- this season, it, this season, it just isn't going to go our way." That's almost like a Bill Buckner play, where it's just like it doesn't matter what's going to happen in Game Seven; your mind is just going to be fixated on the previous game. But the Heat didn't have that affect them. I thought that Duncan Robinson was going to be ice cold in Game Seven, but he was the exact opposite. He came out there firing and was just electric. Yeah, I mean, and you have to give all the props to the Miami Heat because as much as much as they wanted to win, it felt like that's as much as the Celtics were trying to give them the yeah. win. Especially in game seven, and I talked about it earlier, where it was like the first five minutes of the game, it felt close, and it's like um, it kind of felt like the Celtics were, you know, leaving the door open for Miami. And instead of in the previous games, especially in game six, where Miami continued to struggle and didn't really take advantage of it, 
Miami took advantage of it in game seven, and that's pretty much all she wrote because the Celtics – I mean, I don't know. I, I Obviously, I'm not in that locker room, and obviously I'm not a player. But sure. it felt like they went into game seven like it was a regular season game mm. or like they, they – it was like the first two games of a series. Like it, I, it felt like they didn't play like it was a game seven. I mean, I frankly think that they just went into game seven almost assuming that they already won the series. Because if yeah. you I, I if you listen to some of the pregame interviews with Derek White, he was saying like he couldn't stop watching the play. And frankly, I mean, neither could the rest of us. But when you're a player in that situation, you need to understand that you need to move on and you need to get ready for the next for the next uh, challenge ahead of you. And, you know, maybe Derek White did because he went out in game seven. And he was and he played his ass off. He looked great. Uh, but I don't know if everyone else did. I think that everyone else was kind of sluggish and then uh, just couldn't get anything going. And. You know, you saw that with Tatum, you know, you know, even still injured. But in game six, he wasn't anything special from three point. And neither was Jalen Brown. I I looked it up over the past uh, over their last two games. So in game six and seven at Eastern Conference Finals, they shot a combined two of 25 from three, which it, it's so bad. And listen, this was <sighs> th- this was the this was the whole Joe Missoula Men- mentality of live by the three, die by the three, and they died by the three in this in this series. They said like, all right, if we yep. are going to, if we're we're going to huck up these shots, and if they don't go in, we're not going to win this game, and we and we are not going to change up our game plan, and that cost them. And it was just it was infuriating to watch because this team we saw it last year they're capable of so much more than just shooting from three. They are so much more capable of it, and they were not willing to change up their strategy. And I actually was listening uh, on like some sports talk radio, like replays. They played Joe Missoula's uh, post game comments and they said, like, do you think this team's too reliant on the three pointer? And he said, no, even after they struggled as much as they did. So uh, something has to change. And I don't know what's going to happen with the Missoula. I think that his job security is fairly safe um, after this year, but there has to be some sort of a systematic uh, change. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. I don't – as much as everyone was kind of hating on Missoula throughout this whole series, mm. at the same time, I couldn't really hate on the fact because even if you remember back to the beginning of the season, yeah, the Ime Udoka thing happened and 100%. Missoula only had like a month to get ready and like create a game plan. So, mm. I mean, I don't blame him as to why his game plan was kind of basic. And it kind of just relied on the three because it was kind of one of the easiest game plans you can really use in the NBA. And granted, having guys like Tatum and Brown and Smart and them, I mean, I'm not going to lie. Those aren't really the guys that should be running an offense like that. No, because they don't really shoot that well from three anyway. But I mean, that's kind of why when it worked, it looked great. But yeah. when it didn't work, that's why the Celtics – you know, that was eventually their downfall. And it does kind of suck, and I don't think Missoula's going to get fired. No, I don't think he I is think, either. And, I mean, I saw a report today that Ime Udoka might be taking three of the Celtics' assistant coaches that were helping Joe Missoula today, or, like, in the past season to Houston. So the Celtics are probably going to get a whole new coaching staff, like, of assistant coaches. And not only did Ime Udoka leave, Will Hardy left – Damon Stoudemire left halfway through the season. So I think it was just kind of a lot of factors that just ultimately ended up with, you know, what happened in game seven. But shout out to Derek White because Derek White. Derek White was a dog. He was MJ a... in the last two games. Yeah, so. he, you know, he was actually amazing. So uh, credit to Derek White. Uh, I really don't have too many complaints with him. I mean, he did everything he could to stay in the series. And, you know, he was one of those guys that, guys that really looked like he wanted to play. So. Uh, I have no complaints with him, but one guy that I think uh, a lot of people are going to have complaints about right now is Jalen Brown. He took a lot of uh, criticism after game seven because this was the situation that he wanted to be in for a lot. You know, it's been reported that Jalen Brown wants to, you know, kind of be that number one guy or at least wants to be considered the one a on the Celtics. He doesn't want to be, you know, he doesn't want it to just be Tatum and Brown. He want he wants it to be like, you know, like as if you could interchange those names. But yeah. he had every chance to prove himself, and he completely fell short. I mean, the poor shot selection was horrendous. I mean, 
it's it I, hard I, to watch. I, I, I forget I forget who said it, but someone said that Jalen Brown is the greatest player of all time that does not know how to dribble. And I don't remember who said it, but that is a fairly accurate assessment of Jalen Brown's game because his dribbling is just horrendous. I mean, he sends the ball off his knee at least like three times a game. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I'm not going to lie. I hate to say this because I always thought the argument was stupid. But mm-hmm. the Jason Tatum versus Jalen Brown debate, I always thought it was stupid. I did too. Like, I always thought Jason Tatum was better. But that's just because, I mean, it's kind of obvious because, I mean, the only real criticism you can give Tatum is the fact that his shot selection at times can be kind of questioned because, like, he only really takes three-pointers and layups. Mm -hmm. So, like, if he could do any more in the mid-range, and, I mean, he hasn't been a great mid-range shooter, but at the same time, I mean, if he can do that, I feel like that's something you can fix. But when it comes to Jalen Brown, his problems have always been like fundamental problems like dribbling like eight turnovers the most the most crucial part of the one of the most crucial things in the game of basketball exactly and like he can't go left which is always going to be a problem and anytime he dribbles there's always somebody behind him that's going to be able to poke the ball away because his handle is loose and then when it comes to his defense i mean he, his off-ball defense is terrible. That was the main reason as to why Philly even made that a series because I think it was, what, game four when Harden hit that shot to win the game for yeah. Philly? It's because Jalen Brown wasn't covering him in the corner. So it's just kind of one of those things where it's like, I love Jalen Brown, and I think he should stay on this team. But at the same time, I don't think he's the number one guy and I think they should kind of build the offense more around Tatum than Brown. So yeah, I, I just mean, thought the argument itself was stupid, but I think it's pretty obvious now as to who's the better guy. Yeah, no, Ian, I frankly agree with you. I don't think that it was, it ever should have been an argument of Tatum or Brown. I think that Tatum has always been in terms of skill, the superior player, but I would say that, there have been times where Jalen Brown has stepped up when Jason Tatum has, you know, been injured or gone down in previous previous times, specifically last year's finals. I mean, I remember in game six, he put up 35 points when Jason Tatum had that nagging shoulder injury and legitimately just did not show up. So, I mean, there have been, there are instances like still done this, but still, even though in the finals though, let's be honest here. I mean, both of them weren't very good. There were, there were games, there were games where Jalen Brown played well, but most of the time, both of them were really bad. So I, 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 I would, I would agree. Like, I'd agree with that. But if you had to ask me what player played better in the finals, it was easily Jalen Brown. Brown. I mean, I and, Brown. but again, I will say that Tatum was hurt in that final. So I do give him some flack for that. I'm not saying or, or some uh, slack for that. I'm not going to I'm not going to like hold that against him completely, even though, you know, like your shoulder, you need that in your shooting motion. But um, yeah, like this. This was a this was a good chance for Brown to step up and say like all right you're considered the number two guy someone that's going to be vying for a max deal uh the super max in fact so um this should have been the moment where he said like all right I'm gonna take over and I'm gonna show you guys why I'm worth this money and he just couldn't which um yeah. which is really frustrating and right now it doesn't look like he's gonna be going anywhere I saw that there was a report by Brian Windhorst saying that he would be quote stunned if Brown removed um and he expects him to actually remain in Boston. Um, so there is that, um, he didn't say whether there was going to be, you know, a contract or something worked out, but he just said that at least for next year, which Brown is signed through, um, he does expect him to be with the C's. So I don't know what that's going to look like, but is there a, is there a move in your mind that you would want to do, um, in exchange for Jalen Brown? Frankly, I know that there, um, have been potential moves involving, uh, Damian Lillard that have been floated around. Um, you know, someone that you've actually, uh, you know, worked and talked with in the Celtics, uh, community of Ryan Steiner from Celtics, everything. He floated the idea of possibly getting Carl Anthony towns. If the Minnesota was to ever make him available, would any of those moves interest you? If, uh, if it was a possibility. See, I don't know. I'm not going to lie to you. The Jalen Brown situation is, oh, the Celtics are in a weird spot with Jalen Brown because, I don't think there's a trade out there that if you trade Jalen Brown, the Celtics become better. 
I feel like no matter who you trade Jalen Brown to, the Celtics are going to become worse overall. Like, even if you trade it to Portland, I mean, Damian Lillard is cool, but he's still, I mean, he's kind of just an older version of, you know, the same problems that Jalen Brown has. Damian Lillard's not the greatest defender. And, I mean, he's had times in the playoffs where he's come up short and his shooting isn't there. And he's going to be making more money than Jalen Brown ever could have made. So I feel like that's going to be a problem in itself. And then even if you trade it for a guy like Towns, I don't think Carl Anthony Towns is better than Jalen Brown overall. I think, I mean, I think Carl Anthony Towns would be cool with the Celtics, but I don't think he'll be very good. So it's kind of, it's kind of a weird situation where I don't see a trade out there that'll make the Celtics better if they trade him. But at the same time, they could be potentially handicapping the team if they sign him to the Supermax. So you're kind of in a catch-22 here with Jalen Brown. But I do think you should keep him. It's just going to be interesting to see. Because then you still have to pay Jason Tatum. Yeah. And that's going to be even more than Jalen Brown. So it's kind of a weird a weird conundrum. Yeah, it, it definitely is a, a weird conundrum, as you'd say. But I look at this team and I – if I had to pick one of those two stars that I actually want, I'd probably more lean Carl Anthony Towns than Damian Lillard. And I think that Lillard is probably the superior player, but I think for what the Celtics would be building, I think you would be in a better spot if you were to go with Carl Anthony Towns. And maybe to go back to that defensive philosophy that Ime had of, you know, like kind of defending down low and playing that more style well, basketball. Not really good defender. But well, okay. <laughs> not, I, well, not, not defend, <laughs> I, 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 but I, I, well, more just the idea of having a bigger presence down low. Ian, that's yeah. kind of my take with it. That, no, that, I get that. that. That's my thing. And listen, I, I like Rob down low. I think that he's, you know, excellent. But, you know, he's had injury problems. And I think that to get one of these newer age, bigger centers would help this team when you're facing off against guys like Embiid and Giannis and would do you better. Yeah, I mean, I think so, too. It's just like, I don't know. There's always something. Like, I feel like there's something missing with Cat. Yeah, where it's like it, it he might fall into the same trap that Jason Tatum can fall into sometimes, where sure. it's like he's not engaged a hundred percent of the time, all the time. Mm-hmm. So that could potentially cause a problem. But if we were talking about moves, and I hate to say it, I feel like we have to move on from Al Horford, mm, and I yeah. love Al. I, do I just don't think he can be a starter anymore. He he kind of proved in this playoff run that you know, father times starting to catch up a little bit. Yeah. I mean, so like, I would, I would like, I would like a guy like towns to replace Horford in the starting lineup, but it's just kind of like, it's just one of those things where it's like, I feel like that's kind of going to be more of a priority than Jalen Brown right now. Yeah. At least in my opinion for this year moving forward, because I feel like the Celtics can still just retool and run it back with the same roster. And I feel like they'll be fine. But the years after is when you can worry about Jalen Brown. I just feel like you need to worry about retooling the team as it is right now. Yeah, I do agree with you that Horford's, you know, seen better days. He's uh, I think that at this point, like I'd like Horford almost like take a Udonis Haslam kind of approach. And, you know, if he was to play less minutes <laughs> and was to kind of just be like that coaching guy from the sideline, I'd love him like that. I think that, uh, you know, the guys would, would love him and respect him and. You know, you check him in every now and then you have some fun with it. But like, yeah, like he's not fit to be a starter anymore, I think, at this point. And he played he played great defense on Embiid. Yeah, I, I give him credit for that. It's just like and yeah, I think offense. I think I think he had that critical block on a out of bio and on was Bam it? too. Oh, oh, yeah. Game well, six. Yeah. On, on in what game? Yeah. OK, okay. Game six. Yeah. But like, it's just like, I don't know. I feel like Al would be cool off the bench. Mm. I feel like having Al off the bench, you know, like the way they used Robert Williams off the bench, mm-hmm. I feel like if you used Al off the bench that way, I feel like he could be even more effective. Yeah, because you could get him in shorter so, spurts. Exactly. And when he's on, he's on. So I feel like he's kind of – he could kind of be the Grant Williams guy off the bench because we don't really know what's going to happen with Grant. He could leave this off season, So mm-hmm. it's yeah. going to be – going to be interesting to see what they end up doing yeah something that's also kind of been floated is uh maybe if you know you decide to you know maybe move on from marcus smart that he's uh you know they've considered this to be a trio of tatum brown and smart i've never seen it as such a thing but from 
uh, when you apparently a lot of people on the media outside of Boston consider this to be a trio, which blows my mind. I've yeah. like, but like, like this is a this is because like I think that um they wanted to do that. If you remember, they did that Sports Illustrated cover with Tatum and Brown. They yeah, said, with Tatum and, Brown and Smart. Yeah, and, and and they ended up saying like, we're not going to do the cover if you don't put Marcus Smart on with us. And they were, and they were like, okay, sure. And ever since then, people have tried to think that this is like some big three kind of thing, which. It's so far from that. It's it is a dynamic duo. Like you can say that those two are a great one two punch. Marcus Smart is just a role player, though, in my opinion. He's a good one. He does his job. He was last year's defensive player of the year as a guard, which is impressive enough. But um, I think that's something could I think you could see him potentially get moved. And it wouldn't be the worst thing, I think, for this team, because right now, Marcus Smart seems to be in like somewhat of a big presence of the team. Like he seems to have more of a role in the locker room than a guy like Tatum does somehow. Like he seems to have more of that voice. And I think that in order for Tatum to kind of get that maturity and grow up and finally uh, take charge of the team, maybe you do have to send a guy like, like smart out the door. So Tatum can finally become that captain, become that voice of the team. Yeah. I mean, I saw a lot of people talking about that too. And it's like, I would really like Tatum to step up and become more of a vocal leader. Mm -hmm. It just, and, like, I know it's just, like, it doesn't really feel that way. Like, that's, like, just kind of not the person he is. And, like, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Not every single person is going to be this, you know, rah-rah, yelling at everybody kind of leader. And not all of them have but to be. Like, exactly. And, like, he, I feel like if he can have more of a leadership role on the team, I feel like it'll help him a lot more. Um, But it's always so weird with Marcus Smart because it's, like, there's so many positives, but the positives get get can get completely weighed down by the negatives. Yeah, about Marcus Smart and like you just you never know what's gonna happen with him. And I think if the Celtics can make a trade like the Bucks did with Drew Holiday, maybe maybe that's what you have to do. The Bucks remember when the Bucks had like Eric Bledsoe as their starting point guard yeah. for so long and. It wasn't going to work, and then they made the trade for Drew Holiday, and they immediately won a championship. Yeah, maybe that's going to happen with the Celtics. And I hate to—I'm not going to call Marcus Smart Eric Bledsoe, but no, maybe it's just that kind of situation where you just need a different guy because yeah. Marcus Smart's been there for so long. I mean, he's been what's next year going to be his like tenth season in the league. Yeah, I think I mean, he he's got drafted in like, like 2014, right? Yeah, I think so. I think I think this will be his tenth season, which is crazy that he's been around. Crazy to think long. about. Yeah, yeah, and like I would hate to see him go because I love Marcus Smart, but for the betterment of the team, I feel like you kind of have to weigh your options a little bit more with him. I I don't know. Maybe if it's just to improve the roster, if you if you can find a trade for a guy that will 100% lock down the guard position. I feel like you kind of have to make that move if Marcus Smart has to be in it. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. And I mean, if you look at the guard situation, we have a ton of surplus there because, you know, in addition to Smart, we have Brogdon, we have White. So, like, we have the ability to move on from at least one of those guys this offseason. I think that Smart could potentially be that guy because I think White's earned his stripes here. I think that he should be sticking around. And then, uh, Malcolm Brogdon, I know he struggled in game seven, but that elbow just did not look right. I mean, if you saw him airball that that yeah. three-pointer by uh, like four feet, you could just tell he had absolutely no feeling in that thing as he was shooting. Yeah, and I mean, Malcolm Brogdon is also another guy that could get moved because mm -hmm. he is on, I think he's on an expiring contract. Yeah, this, this is year. the, yeah, well, next, yeah, next year is going to be the last year of his deal. Next year is the last year. So, I mean, you could maybe see him moving on from Malcolm Brogdon, which would kind of be interesting because you kind of traded you traded your first round pick for him mm -hmm. and moving on from him might be a little bit interesting depending on who it is. But that's the other problem that I'm kind of having is I'm trying to figure out players that you could move on the from these guys for. Yeah, like, is is there anyone in? Do you know of anyone in the free agent class this year that would like really spark your name? I don't know if that's anything that you that you've checked. I don't know. I mean, I've looked. I haven't looked a ton. Sure. I know like the big names, like I know Harden and Kyrie mm -hmm. and them. I don't know like I don't really. I haven't heard of like any high level role player. Maybe Fred Van Fleet, because mm. I know he's a free agent this year. Okay. 
I don't know if I'd move on from Smart for Fred Van Fleet or yeah. Brogdon for Fred Van Fleet, but I don't know. It's just like it doesn't feel like there's a whole lot of like big names out there. Mm-hmm. Like it, there's not like a Drew Holiday out there from what I can think of. You know, it maybe I I heard somebody I, I was on a different podcast and someone floated Shea Gilgis Alexander. Really? I think there's no way in hell the Thunder I, trade Shea Gilgis Alexander. I, 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 what would that package look like? It would have to be Jalen Brown. It has to be that's that would have to be a Jalen Brown trade, but I don't know. It's just like that'd be like Jalen Brown plus, like yeah, exactly. to get Shea. That's crazy. It just doesn't feel like there's a guy out there right now in the market to where you could say moving on from a guy like Smart or Brogdon would be better. Yeah. So it's it's it, the Celtics are in a weird spot right now. I honestly don't see them making a huge change. Mm-hmm. I really don't see it. I feel like they're just going to sign a lot of depth guys and hope it works out. Yeah. So. Like, like, kind of like what they did last year when they signed Josh Richardson and Dennis Schroeder at the beginning of the year. Yeah, and it didn't work out, but you traded for Derek White, and it ended up working out pretty okay. So, mm-hmm. I feel like the Celtics will end up trying to go back to that, where they just kind of sign some guys, hope they work, and if they don't, they move on from the deadline. Yeah. So that's that's kind of what I see the Celtics doing this off season when it yeah, comes we'll, to that. Yeah, we'll have to see if Brad Stevens actually goes back to that philosophy of trying to make some deadline acquisitions like he did uh, when he got Derek White. Um, I know that this past deadline, the biggest move he had was acquiring Mike Muscala. So like that was the only move he had. <laughs> yeah. So like I, I, you will have to see uh, if he, if he can sense the ability to maybe get some uh, higher player guys in the middle of the season, if that's something he decides to do. So uh, we'll have to look at how that moves, how that goes uh, moving forward. But Ian, I know that, you know, as the Heat move on to the NBA Finals, they're facing off against, uh, uh, you know, Nikola Jokic and the Denver Nuggets. We, I mean, everyone was saying that Boston was going to be an impossible task, but this is a different animal for the Heat. I mean, people, you know, people even around here thought that if the Celtics made it to the Finals, they had a good chance of getting swept by uh, Denver. So, do you even think that the Heat have a prayer in this thing, or do you think it's uh do you think it's a wrap? I would love to say Nuggets and four, just because I'm. I'm mad that the Heat beat us. And yeah, I mean, it just feels like the Nuggets are better in every single way. It's not like a Milwaukee situation, unless Nikola Jokic gets injured mm. or Jamal Murray gets injured again. I really don't see a, I don't see a chance where Miami ends up beating the Nuggets. I just feel like the Nuggets are such a complete team and everyone, everyone on that team is huge. Yeah. Like Miami, Miami has a lot of guards. Like they got Gabe Vincent, they got Caleb Martin, who he's bigger. Jimmy Butler is bigger, but like they don't have guys like Michael Porter Jr. or Aaron who's a Gordon. six, who's like a six ten small forward. Exactly, it's, 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 Aaron it's, it's is like six eight. Yeah. and Jamal Murray, he's a tall point guard. And I mean, they got KCP. He can shoot. I mean, they they just have so many guys on the Nuggets where it's just like. I know we said the Celtics depth was really good. I feel like the Nuggets depth is even better than that. Yeah. And I mean, I'm not going to lie. If the Celtics made the finals, they probably would have lost to Denver in like four or five, maybe mm-hmm. six games. Yeah. So you might have dodged a bullet there. But yeah, I mean, it's even kind of one of those things where it's just like it feels like it's Nuggets here. Yeah. Even if you felt that the Celtics like depth wise and talent wise matched up, I feel like they would have just been so exhausted from this series. Like the Nuggets would have had. Maybe the Celtics, they could have gotten hot and maybe won game one because they had just played and the finals start tomorrow. And it's like, hey, like, you know, we're in a groove right now. We can go out and just like play game one where Denver's sat for a week and maybe they're slow. But I think that Denver would catch up pretty quick. So, yeah, um, Denver is too good of a team to do that. And Mike yeah. Malone's a really good head coach, too. So. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, credit to him. Credit to Eric Spolstra for getting back there. I mean. You know, his story, I don't know if you've been seeing it throughout uh, Sports Center what, yeah, whatnot, but it. It, yeah, it's yeah. it's been crazy. Like the fact that he went from a video editor to uh being in the finals for six times now. So uh, I mean, that's the other thing. That's the other thing though. I, like I said, I'd like to say the Nuggets are gonna win the series easily, but you never know with Miami. Yeah. So I don't know, maybe Eric Spolstra pulls out some magic like he did in game seven yeah. or like he did against Milwaukee. I don't know. He, 
it's just like I wanna I wanna count up Miami, but I just can't. So yeah, you know, I'm I'm still gonna say like Nuggets in five. I think Miami wins one at home. But I, I think I can see that. I think Denver is gonna win the first two. Miami maybe wins game three. And then Denver wins four and five. That's that's probably what I'm thinking. Mm-hmm. And this was something I actually talked about on my last show too, and it was that uh, just how much, um, you know, kind of like the disrespect that Nikola Jokic has been getting, uh, you know, in the media. The Nuggets just like, team in general. Yeah, he had, like they've gotten like zero attention for how well they've done. So um, I feel this... like I feel like it's crazy that nobody talked about the fact that this is the first time they've ever made a finals. Yeah, like I feel like I feel like if any other team did that like it would be talked about more, but like this is the first time they ever made a finals. Yeah. I feel like that should be a bigger talking point than it is. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Nikola Jokic is one of the best centers that we've ever seen. And do you think that this, if he was to secure the championship that he would finally get the recognition he deserves? Or do you think that just playing in a market like Denver, he's always going to be overlooked? It's going to be a wild thought. He might end up being like a top 15 player of all time. If he wins the ring this year. Really, two time MVP. I, I, I mean, I'm I'm not, probably... I'm not I'm not I'm not I'm not saying that like I'm disagreeing with you, but I'm just it's just kind of an in awe thing. It is crazy to think about, but like he's already a two time MVP, multiple time All Star. If he balls out in this final series, he wins Finals MVP and a ring, and he probably should have won MVP this year. I mean, he's already. I feel like he already passes Giannis all time. Mm. Two time MVP. I feel like his two MVPs, I mean, it wasn't really his fault. I mean, did Giannis win the championship in his MVP season? Um, I'd have to look that up when he won his. I I can't remember what years he won it, but. Yeah, I'll look that up. Giannis MVPs. Um, He won it in the 2018-19 season, so not that so, year. It was back to back. It was 18-19 and then 19-20, right? I believe so, yeah. All right, yeah. So regardless. Yeah, so I mean, no. I feel like I feel like Nikola Jokic could arguably be above Giannis all time, depending on what he does in this final series. So I feel like I feel like if the Nuggets win and Jokic wins finals MVP, I feel like it'll be more of a conversation of who's gonna be better all time between Giannis and Jokic. I feel like both of them will be close to the top ten. Hmm. especially regardless of what they do for the rest of their career, they have a ring and that's yeah. pretty much all that matters. <laughs> yeah. They've proven they can do it, which is like, you know, the, in my opinion, it's the biggest, you know, it's like kind of the biggest like check Mark that, a, that a player can have. And, you know, I know that there are plenty of great players that, that didn't win championships, but for those that do, there is just, a, I think in my opinion, like something that separates them. Especially if you go like top 10 players of all time. Yeah. How many of them have no championships? None of them. Yeah. I, I don't know a top 10 list that doesn't have a player that hasn't won a championship. It's just kind of one of those things where it's like, it feels like if you want to be in that upper echelon of players all time, you have to win a ring. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's going to be interesting. I mean, yeah. if Miami wins it, then Jimmy Butler will have his case for being in <laughs> conversations of being one of the best players. So which either is, way, which is which is which even with all the success that Jimmy Butler has had, doesn't it just still feel weird that he is like, you know, actually able to do this at, and be like be that number one player? It's and and I I respect Jimmy Butler for, um you know, being like, you know, going into Minnesota and taking all the scrubs on the practice team and beating the starters. You know, that's one of the classic stories of Jimmy Butler and just being able to like run through these playoffs and with essentially a bunch of role players it's incredible the fact that he is just like able to do this as the number one guy. I've all, I always thought that he would have to have someone else of, you know, a higher, you know, skill level beside him, but he's proving he can just outlast these teams. Yeah. It's, it's always weird with Jimmy Butler because like, I don't know. It, I guess it all depends. If he loses this finals and he has a bad finals, then mm -hmm. I feel like nobody will care. Yeah, But if he makes it a competitive series and he – let's just say he pushes it to six or seven games yeah. and he single-handedly does it by himself, I mean, it's going to be a crazy thing Yeah, because it always feels like Jimmy Butler 
I think it's just because he never like goes all out during the regular season. Mm-hmm. So like by the end of the year, you're, you're like, oh, Jimmy Butler's really underrated, and you know how is he not like a top five player in the NBA? Well, it's because throughout the entire regular season, nobody thinks about him because yeah. he just kind of you know he he's I'm on cruise control. Coast. Exactly, he just kind of cruises through the regular season until it comes playoff time. Yeah, he does so, what he yeah. needs to do. Exactly, and it's gonna be it's gonna be a weird situation <laughs> if he if he wins a ring. Because then, because then he might actually have the case of being better than Tatum. Mm. So, but as of right now, Jimmy Butler and Jason Tatum have the same amount of rings. So, yeah, we'll have to see. <laughs> yeah, we will have to see there. But Ian, I think that's what we have uh, for NBA news. I do want to touch on one thing in the NFL before we do go, and that was uh, the news that DeAndre Hopkins um, was actually released by the Arizona Cardinals um, within the past week. I meant to cover this on my show, but I didn't do one on Friday. So I just wanted to get that out of the way. So, uh, you know, DeAndre Hopkins, one of the best receivers in the NFL, obviously had the steroids, uh, had the steroid scandal last year, missed the first six games of the season, was still a pretty productive receiver. But Arizona is going in a different direction. They're looking to fully rebuild that operation out there. So um, they had looked for a trade partner for, you know, months now. They were trying to find anything to get him, but they weren't going to find a package that wasn't that was going to fit what they wanted. So uh, they released him. He's on the open market and can sign with any team. I don't know how much of a football guy you are, Ian, but is there a team that you think that, you know, he's going to be favored to go to? I mean, I'm not going to lie to you as a Patriots fan. I hate the fact that he didn't get traded. Yeah. Now that he got released, he can go anywhere. Like if the Patriots like made a move for him, then he would have to be a Patriot. Yeah, but like the fact that he got released, he can go anywhere. And I mean, I hate to say it, but if you're DeAndre Hopkins and you have every team in the NFL, is the Patriots really at the top of your list? No, it, it's not. It's, exactly. So it's like I'm not gonna lie to you. I could see him going to a place like Kansas City. I've heard or... Kansas, I've heard Kansas City is like basically the hot spot for him to go to. And exactly, I could see him going Kansas City, Buffalo, or Baltimore because he can. Yeah, I feel like it'd be cool to see him in Baltimore with Lamar Jackson. I feel like that would be cool. But if he goes to a team like Buffalo or Kansas City or even Cincinnati, I mean, I don't yeah. think he'd go to Cincinnati. No. But um, if he goes to, like, Kansas City or Buffalo, it wouldn't shock me because he can go to any team he wants to. And as a Patriots fan, it'll be sad. But, I mean, there's really nothing you can do. Although I still feel like it's weird that the Cardinals couldn't find any trade partner for him. Well, I think I think they just wanted so much for him and they knew they weren't going to get it. I think they wanted like multiple picks. They really wanted a good package and they were trying to win win a trade and no team was going to say like they no team was going to be like, "All right, we'll give you a second round pick for this guy." They didn't want to do the deal. So, yeah. there's that and I don't know what it's going to look like. I you know, it's frustrating cuz even if I'll say this, even if DeAndre Hopkins said, "I want to be a Patriot" and he signed with us, we're still not favored in our own division. We're not, probably not even still favored to finish. <laughs> we're still probably not even fit, favored to finish third in our own division at that point. So like, yeah, we're even being the wild card. Yeah, like like we'd still be like fighting it out with the Dolphins just to try to make it into the wild card because you got Aaron Rodgers and now you have Josh Allen uh, doing their thing and they're probably going to be at the, in those top two slots. So, um, you know, we would have been battling battling it out for a wild card anyways. So. I don't know how much of, it, of a difference he would have really made for us. I mean, Mac Jones is, would have would had to have made a uh, significant jump, and I just don't yeah, know if that's uh, going to happen. Like, so yeah, that 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 would have been in the best possible situation of of Hopkins saying like, "Oh, it's my dream to be a Patriot," which who knows? Maybe it is. Maybe he does want to uh, smooth things over with Bill O'Brien and uh, work it out and come to Foxborough and get and have to deal with that grind from Bill Belichick. Maybe that's maybe that's the way he's wired, but. I saw the interview where, you know, they listed potential free agent or trade destinations for him. And they said like, Hey, like give us a facial reaction and new England showed up and he just had like kind of like no emotion. And then Kansas city Buffalo. And I think like uh, Baltimore showed up and he was just like smiling. It was like, send me there. He was like smiling thumbs up. He was just like, he couldn't say it. Cause that's like tampering, but he was w- very much on board with it. So if he goes to Buffalo, it's just going to be insult to injury. It's not going to be a matter of them, you know, winning more games or doing anything. Bro, to Stephon us. Diggs and D-Hop on the same team. Would be That's wild. deadly. That's deadly. That'd be wild. Yeah. 
even him in Kansas City. Mm-hmm. I mean, him and Travis Kelsey in Kansas City. I mean, him and I mean Mark Andrews and D Hop in Baltimore would be cool. It, well, I mean, not not to mention not to mention OBJ and Zay Flowers now part of that mix too. True, I forgot about that. Yeah, I like Zay Flowers too. I wish the Patriots got him, but yeah. I like Christian Gonzalez too. Mm-hmm. Anyway, but yeah, I mean, it just feels like there's so many more options out there for D Hop that like. I just don't feel like he would choose the Patriots even no. like, I mean, I feel like he would have had to gotten traded to the Patriots for it to actually work. Yeah. It just, there's just too many better teams than the Patriots out there that he could mm-hmm. go to. And I mean, if I'm him, I just want to win a ring. Yeah. that That's what I'd be going for. I mean, at this point, you're not going to be able to sign like a really lucrative deal. Like it's, it's may that's not when all these free agents sign. So I frankly think he's going to go to Kansas city. I do, because if you look at Kansas city last year, You know, they had a great year. They obviously won the Super Bowl, but they didn't even have a definitive number one receiver. There was a hole there after Tyreek Hill left, but they managed to fill it well enough with guys like Sky Moore, uh, Juju Smith-Schuster, and whatnot. So if they put a really defined number one receiver in there, that's going to sure up all their problems, and I think they just run it back to the chip again. I mean, they're they're the favorites to run it back to the chip regardless. So just adding D-Hop is just another weapon that, a lot of teams aren't going to stop. So it'll be interesting. I mean, I feel like if I'm D hub, I'd ring chase. That's what I would do. I think that's what he's going to end up doing. I just hope he doesn't go to Buffalo. If he goes to Kansas city, if he goes to Kansas city, I'll be mad about it. But at the same time, I mean, I don't, I wouldn't blame him, but if he goes to Buffalo and I have to watch him twice a year, it's going to be so annoying. Yeah, if he goes to Kansas- they the Patriots already don't have anybody that can stop Stephon Diggs, and the no. fact that it would have to be Diggs and D-Hop you have to stop, that'd be even more annoying. Yeah, Christian Gonzalez would be getting work early on in his career. Yeah, would be uh that'd be real rough. The amount him. of times the amount of times Miles Bryant would get cooked <laughs> by Stephon Diggs is insane. I mean, Miles <laughs> Bryant's getting cooked by anyone, so that's not a that's that's a non factor. True, true. But imagine you have to throw him out there against D Hop and yeah. Stephon Diggs. Yeah, it would look like a it would look like an old like highlight reel mixtape. It would be pretty bad. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Ian, I think that kind of covers what we have uh, in that in that circle of the NFL. I w- I did just want to bring that up because I didn't have a chance to mention it on the show previously, so I appreciate that. But uh, I have to say it. I think we are now down to the wire. So. We're going to wrap up what we uh, talked about today and uh, send you guys on your way. But before we do that, if you guys are not following down to the wire, make sure you guys follow us on all streaming platforms, uh, whether it be Spotify, Apple podcast, Google podcast, YouTube. Uh, you can find all of those links in our Instagram bio at down dot to the wire. So uh, follow that on Instagram. If you have anything that you want to uh, you know, check out with us. So Ian, I'll throw it over to you as well. Is there uh you know, you know, I'll let you kind of tell people how they can find you. Yes. Uh, so you can follow me on my social medias. Uh, I and Angelo, I, I, N, A, N, G, L, O on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, all that, all the same. Yeah. Wait. Perfect. All right. Sweet. So uh, just to kind of wrap up what we talked about, we broke down. Uh, The Celtics falling short of making history, trying to join the 2004 Red Sox as uh you know, some Boston teams to come back from 0-3 deficits. They fell short in game seven after uh, the Heat just completely dominated them from start to finish. Tatum rolled his ankle. Everything just seemed to go wrong. We discussed the future of Jalen Brown with the team, whether uh, he could potentially be on the move as well as some potential targets the Celtics could try to go after in free agency. And we talked about the uh, future of, uh, you know, the well, the future of Marcus Smart, different things like that. We previewed the NBA Finals. Uh, with the Miami Heat and Denver Nuggets. And we ended things off today uh, by discussing DeAndre Hopkins being released by the Arizona Cardinals and potential trade destinations for him. Ian, I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming on again today. Of course, anytime. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and from down the wire, I'm Brian Costa. I'm Ian and Angela. And we hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Take care. Peace out.